on to direct points. We're all here for is the open dialogue between the four of us. So we'll start. Um, so Danielle, do you want to tell the story of how this book came to be? Yes. So I will start way back in like, I don't even know, 2014, 2015. This was a long time ago. Um, I was doing um, my dissertation and I was doing elite interviews and I didn't know how to do elite interviews. I'd never done it before. And so, but I had read Nadia's first book and um, in the appendix, Nadia had really outlined like everything she did. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna model what I do after this because it's in a, it's a, a similar van of what I wanted to do. Um, and I was in the write-up stage and I was like, let me just like see, maybe she's willing to give me some feedback. Let me see what she thinks. And so I sent Nadia a cold email and so generously she agreed to like read my stuff and then get on the phone and talk about it. And then like, we just kind of like kept in touch uh, from there. Um, and then one thing led to another and Nadia was like, hey, I wanna do this study. W would you be interested in collaborating on, you know, like an experiment that manipulates the appearance of a black woman candidate? And I was like, yeah. And then from that collaboration, Nadia was like, well, would you be interested in writing a book? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And so that happened. I don't know, 2017. So it was quite a while ago, um, but that's how the, the collaboration came to be. Nadia, you wanna share your take? Yeah, so those are all accurate um, points from Danielle's vantage point. From my vantage point, I had babies <laughs> and I recognized that I could not write this book in the way that I envisioned writing this book um, because I, I didn't have the flexibility to just get up and go and um, follow Black women candidates around the campaign trail, which was how I originally envisioned the book. Um, and I knew from the meeting with Danielle that she is a mythological whiz kid. And I was like, I don't know any of this stuff, but I'm willing to learn <laughs> and to work and partner um, with Danielle. And so the project is really, um, I think, a beautiful blend of both of us. So the first half of the book is my interpretivist methods, um, my ethnography interviewing. And the back half of the book is where Danielle really shines with the surveys, the experiments, um, manipulations that, that she does. But I think we both recognize that we had something bigger here and that this could work based on our, um, our unique methodological skill set, but also our deep commitment to doing culturally appropriate work on women of color. And I think that was the, um, like the glue that kind of held us together. So there were times when we were writing where um, Danielle would ask questions about things that I had written uh, about black women's hair and being a black woman with Afro textured hair with having three little girls that I have to do their hair once a week, if not more, right? Like I am knee deep in Afro textured hair. That's my life now. And so I'm just saying things or writing things as if everybody is aware of things that you have to do to maintain um, Afro textured hair. So it was really useful for me to write this with Danielle, to, for Danielle to say, I don't know what that is, <laughs> right? Like other people probably don't know what this is. And it made me, um, it, you know, made me become a more clearer uh, writer and to get really intentional about what I was saying to bring people along like Danielle who want to read the book, want to engage with the work, but just need the signpost. Um, so I'm grateful to hear that from a friend, from someone who, again, right, is it coming with a pejorative stance on how um, we're talking about Black women's bodies, but it's actually asking questions in a in a way that engages the material, the history, um, the social political history of Black women's hair and bodies um, that makes me write the front end in a way that I I definitely would not have written it if there was not, you know, Danielle didn't read it. Like hands down, yeah, that wouldn't have happened. Um, then I'll also share, um, because I, I don't want to take up too much time, but it was a very fun book to write. So <laughs> Danielle and I, um, uh, we partnered with the Black Women's Pack in Texas, and we collected focus groups with them. And then when we weren't 
collecting research. We were in Dallas um, having a good time. Um, she also came to Indianapolis where we did focus groups um, on members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and had a really good time afterwards. So it's it's nice to be able to work and play with um, with a colleague who's able to to just to really be a full multifaceted collaborator, right? In the shenanigans and in the good writing. <laughs> Danielle, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think I think I think that's right. I remember when we um, were doing the focus groups when I was packing the like, what am I going to wear? I was like, well, this needs to be like a day to night look so that I can look good wherever we go afterwards. <laughs> so it, it, it was a really fun book. I mean, I think for me, the most important thing that came out of this that I really deeply appreciated was having a co-author who thinks about the ethics of what they're doing. I think that in political science, you know, because we're so positivist heavy, we don't talk enough about ethics. Like, yeah, sure, okay, you're talking to politicians, you know, a lot of these folks are lawyers, they are very powerful people, but you still have to respect them as individuals. And it's your responsibility to think through what are the implications of like what you report when you report these interviews. Because, you know, Nadia has written about this too, like they'll just start telling you a lot of things in the moment and you have to decide, am I gonna publish this? or not, can this be used against them in some way in the future? And you have to think through five years from now, you don't know what that politician is gonna be experiencing. You don't know if they're still gonna be in office. They could just be you know, a private person by the time your work comes out and you don't wanna be the one that harms their reputation in some way. And so it's a lot of um, proactive thinking and just treating participants with a lot of respect that I think often gets forgotten um, when we do elite studies because they're politicians and we're like, oh, they're so strategic, but they're still people and you have to remember that. And then I, I'll, I'll add a challenge that we had. It was different. It's difficult to work with any co-author, right? And you usually should, I think you should kind of lay out the, the writing style, your working preferences, how you're going to save drafts in the document and the document. I mean, those type of ins and outs are like super important to think about. And we didn't think about that in advance. <laughs> right? talk about like the nitty gritty of how you write a book with someone. I, you know, I think that's one of the, the, the things that um, I would like to talk with graduate students about just the practice, the practical things of writing together. Um, and so we all come to the table with our own set of preferences, right? So I might use Mendeley, she might use Otero, right? Like it's just these different things that really matter when, right, when, when you have to write together. Um, and we should have these conversations up front. I've learned that afterwards, right? But what works, at least what works with Danielle and I and my other co-authors, um, it's a deep set of respect that I know that this person is not ill-attentioned or trying to create, you know, some kind of booby trap for me to, to figure out what the hell is the password to get into this or like where would they have saved it? And they're trying to, you know, make me hit my head against the computer 10 times. That's not it. But just having this very like forthright conversations, um, I just, again, like the practical parts of writing together is always a challenge. Um, and some of these can be avoided by having that conversation up front. So one of the things that I appreciated about working with Danielle, we had conversations about the first author. And in my other collaborations, I've always just gone alphabetical order and just a little note that says, all authors have collaborated equally. Um, Recognizing though that Danielle was pre-tenure and I was a tenured professor, there might be an assumption that Danielle did not do as much work on the project that I did, right? So we had these really long, um, and, and again, like well-meaning from a good place conversations about how should we think about first authorship. Um, towards the end, right, we, I'm the first author, I'm still in the academy, Danielle is writing and doing all the things from outside of the academy. Um, and that's what, you know, made, made this transition to Brown Lemmy for the book. But if you look at most of our other publications, right, Danielle is first author. Um, and I, and I say this for, for a very important reason. One, I'm senior, and I don't necessarily need it. Um, I'm not really that Danielle does either. She's, you know, she's a publishing powerhouse. But, 
but I think these are conversations that we need to talk about, right? Like, and how, how are we going to be equitable to junior scholars when you're writing with someone who isn't on the same, um, who isn't on the same, um, you know, promotion and tenure guidelines or promotion and tenure tier as, as you are. Um, so those are the kind of conversations I would say are, were in somewhat a challenge because they're never really comfortable. You never really feel good to talk about those things, but they can be done in a way that's caring, that's respectful, that's empathetic. Um, and for those that are listening, I highly suggest they're done in the future, right? So before the issue comes up, do them before you start writing. So we have talked a lot, or maybe just me. Um, so do we want to, um, Danielle, did you have anything to share? Or should we jump into Dara's um, review of the work? Jump right in. Okay, Dara, you're up next. All right, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts that I had about the book, and I'm going to end with um, some questions that we can think about going forward. So, in Sister Style, The Politics of Appearance for Black Women Political Elites, Dr. Nadia Brown and Dr. Danielle Lemmy foreground the intersectional political perspective of Black women and interrogate the cultural, social, and political implications of Afro-textured hair and skin tone. An innovative contribution, Sister Style reevaluates the everyday social political context of Black women political elites and voters. Brown and Lemmy convincingly demonstrate the impact of racialized gender identity on the political experiences of Black women politicians. Through their focus on reclaiming agency and subjectivity for the Black female body, Brown and Lemmy advance an intersectional analytical framework designed to interpret both voter and candidate interpretations of Black women's politics. Sister Style contends with the reality of intergroup stigma related to skin tone and natural hair and provides a thoughtful analysis of Black sociocultural institutions. Brown and Lemmy demonstrate that Black women are acutely aware of their stratification in a racialized and gendered society, and yet strategically cultivate a political persona they believe to be appropriate and electable. More Black women are serving as elected officials today than any other time in America's history, and this book provides scholars with many opportunities to expand the conversation around their political experiences. While I could probably speak at length or all night or two weeks or whatever <laughs> about how great this book is, I want to focus my comments on what I read as the book's perspective on the context of descriptive representation, importance of intergroup analysis, and the future of Black women as political agents. This work demonstrates the complexity of descriptive representation by carefully deconstructing its necessity and the consequences of cultural representation. For example, the authors point out the significance of Black women's role in the formulation of New Jersey's Creating a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair Act, the Crown Act. They write, their role as Black women legislators, while perhaps not essential, was useful in advancing the Crown Act as they were familiar with Black hair culture and hair discriminatory practices. This finding is expanded on in the third chapter, where at one point, a St. Louis City Councilwoman noted that her hairstyling choices are a point of engagement with some constituents. And what I read from this takeaway is that as elected Black women bring their whole selves to work, they are better able to serve their constituencies substantively with appropriate legislation and political empowerment to the point of mobilization. These benefits are huge. However, as I mentioned, the authors also explain the consequences. Each chapter where dialogue was captured noted some form of criticism related to a Black woman's hair or the struggles that come with having coarse hair in this society. From some white colleagues misunderstanding or purposefully misrepresenting the necessity of a formal bill to protect against hair discrimination, to even Black elders who offer what they believe to be constructive criticism rooted in respectability. Some Black women catch hell for attempting to show up as themselves. Very interested to hear how you both feel about this sort of catch 22, damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of scenario and how that plays out for Black women electeds. I really appreciate Sister Style because it's real. And as real as it is, it is succinctly theorized. Intergroup stigma is a reality for African Americans, and this project addresses it with an understanding only produced in an immersion in a culture and careful attention to one's position in that culture. 
Keenly aware of those positionalities, the authors utilized interpretative, interpretivist methods to really interrogate what was going on in the minds of Black women candidates, elected, and voters. This path of investigation was necessary because there was not a baseline to draw from on how Black on how political scientists discussed the effect of Black women's skin tone and hair, especially not one that didn't point out differences in Black and white folks, as if Black women don't exist on their own. Which isn't surprising, Black feminist politics have been building the literature brick by brick as much as of the rest of the discipline pretends that it's possible to accurately portray civil society without their expertise. Indeed, they write on page 79, holding whites as the comparison group, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Uh, holding whites as a comparison group misconstrues Black women's political socialization on their own terms. And simply, it takes up necessary space for more prudent conversation. I mean, what other book will explain the process of going natural or the big chop? Has anyone else read in political science where they include pictures and explanations of different black hair textures or styles? What elevates this book is the attention to black women specifically, but also the way that these phenotypical choices and decisions affect the potential for electoral success, support, and even action. By taking the intergenerational, multi-shaded, shady, culture that Black women political elites live in, you all highlight important cleavages that political actors must be aware of. Two that I'm especially interested in are the generational cleavages and the potential for regional cleavages. Doctors Brown and Lemmy spoke to a group of Black women voters who chose to join a sorority with a long history of political involvement, which requires its members to be registered to vote and even holds political awareness and involvement as a point of the five point programmatic thrust, which describes the goals of the organization. Emphasizing the role of Black institutions in political socialization, this conversation with our sisters in Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated painted a picture of the view of generational differences, especially between millennials and older generations. Historically, Black sororities discriminated against women with darker skin tones uh, with such things as the paper bag test or people with coarser hair with things such as the pencil test where you stick a pencil in your hair and if it sticks, then your hair is too nappy. Um, and if it slides in, you're probably okay. Um, and even to this day, there's some back and forth about what down and done really means. In fact, um, as they write, the politics of appearance for Black women candidates quickly became a hot topic of conversation as members of the focus group immediately drew comparisons between how a candidate looks and whether or not she is electable. This conversation was fascinating and instructive. As the focus group attendees continue to discuss the strategy behind becoming electable, their generational differences popped out. While everyone was well aware of the reasons why a Black woman would consider switching up their appearance, the split occurred be between those who accepted that and moved accordingly, and those who thought their right to, again, show up as their whole selves was worth the fight, even if they might not win the election. What does that mean, though, for candidates? We saw in the layout of the natural hair movement that as it gained popularity with young folks of each generation, it had different uh, pretenses for others in the community. Even though it was demonstrated that candidates don't always perceive their hair or clothes to be a political statement, we see here that it's probably still something that they have to consider. Not only the natural hair, but makeup and clothes what do these differences in preference or judgment of potential elected officials or other political agents do to their chances for success in majority Black spaces or even in mixed populations? Briefly, I'll comment on the potential for regional differences in phenotypic presentation. In the chapter based on the focus group of political actors in Texas, we see an emphasis on the role of Southern culture. The latest work on political implications of Southern culture by Dr. Princess Williams demonstrates that a Southern identity is a powerful indicator of political preference for some issues apart from racial issues. Here, Southern culture is evoked as a potential silo of conversation. Because of their culture as debutantes or otherwise Southern bells, there weren't that many hairstyling options viewed as acceptable anyway, so the conversation was kind of limited. I'm very interested to learn how the authors feel this conversation would have gone with the more distributed regional representation. 
Finally, my recent baptism into Arkansas politics and the professional political world has really been an eye-opening experience. Working on a high profile campaign gave me the opportunity to not only witness up close the behind the scenes aspects of mobilization and strategy, but it also put me in a position to be mentored by some of the most salient black political actors in the state. The campaign that I'm on has a black male candidate, a black woman campaign manager, a black woman financial director, and a black woman political, di political director. The black woman campaign manager has locked hair and the political director keeps her straight. I'm the deputy field director and my hair changes from week to week. I'm interested to see how or if these style choices make any difference in the way that people interact with us or assumptions that they make about our ability. For now, I can definitely see the generational differences from the way that my mom and my grandma pick at me for my professional dress that they claim isn't professional enough, but whatever or the way that other folks react, even in a positive way, to my high energy at events. They often encourage me to keep it up, but also remark that they don't see many young people engaged in this sort of work in our state. Now, what does that mean? The theory work done here shows us how elected officials, candidates, political elites, and politically active, educated Black women reason through their appearance and, as such, their electability. What about those who aren't college educated and have little reason to believe they should run for office anyway? What sort of representation do they need? I would love to talk through the role of the educated and activated population in spreading the empowerment received from feeling represented or seen. To close, I'll restate my discussion questions. One, how do you all, oh, how do you all suggest Black women candidates navigate the catch-22 of changing or assimilating or remaining true to themselves in the way they present, and how might they answer that change in the future? How might that answer change in the future? Two, how will these generational differences in perception affect Black women candidates and agents in the field? The interviewees made it clear that you kind of have to listen to older Black women, not just to be respectful, but also because those are often your key voters. <laughs> what do you think about the box that that puts candidates in? Third, we saw some mention of the effect of Southern American culture on perceptions and possibilities for appropriate dress. What are your thoughts on what these conversations might have looked like in other places? And finally, for many of us, we are the only one or one of the few from home who went to college or maybe even care about politics. The nuanced findings presented here regarding the perceptions of candidate electability are largely based on the perspective of already elected officials or college educated civic minded people. What are your thoughts on how this perception of pushing the boundary for empowerment versus electability respectability translates to less politically active populations? Thank you for your time. Wow, thank you so much, Dareth. And I also appreciate you giving us a recap of the questions. Um, <laughs> uh, next is Christine Slaughter. Perfect, so that was great, Dara. And thank you for setting up the conversation um, in the way that you have. So I'll try my best not to be repetitive, but it's probably gonna be hard not to. Um, so before delivering my comments on Sister Style, I just want to thank Nadia and Danielle for the invitation to speak on this panel alongside Dara. It's an honor to reflect on the scholarship at this conference, and it's also refreshing that a book on Black women's politics has a central stage at Incope, where the study of Black people and the ways that discrimination, racism, and white supremacy are interrogated in political science. So this is the, the perfect venue. It's imperative and political science that Black politics takes seriously an intersectional approach. And Sister Style really is a masterclass in understanding the intersectional approach and its relevance for politics. So for my allotted time, I'll first just give a brief overview of the book and its contributions. There are many. And then after briefly, I'll discuss the ways that I, um, I discuss the things that I think are important about the book the several parts of the book that I love and also places where I think is worthy for expansion, both theoretically and with additional experiments. And then also um, how appearance just matters broadly um, for Black women. 
So, yes, and why this is important, especially thinking about the role of Black women and being in higher profile positions, one being our Vice President Kamala Harris, but also the recent um, Supreme Court Justice nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson, who is locked and who are entering uh, the political arena on their own terms. So I think these are important things that Sister Style gives us the language to articulate how this is important for the way that we interact um, as voters with our candidates and the way that candidates um, come to represent us as uh, voters. So again, I'll try not to be repetitive, um, but I did prepare some remarks, so this is a little bit inevitable, but I'll just say it always feels good to have something to say. So this is how it addresses several relevant questions on the role of appearance and its political implications. Um, for some, this investigation takes a novel approach and examines a real world phenomenon that it was uniquely bound to particular hair textures and it expands the political science's boundaries. And yes, it, it does that. But this book also serves as a reminder that black women have agency and constraints within political institutions. And despite racial and gendered social progress, more work is needed to shift powers from margin to center, especially when hair textures, which is a form of social um, discrimination on the basis of race, is becoming more protected across several states. So the book addresses the central question, what constraints are placed on Black women's politicians' physical pre presentation in the United States, and how do Black women candidates navigate choices around their appearance? So this is the agency constraint piece that um, I mentioned in the opening. So Brown and Lemmy address these questions and examine how Black women political elites make fashion, hairstyle, and beauty decisions as it pertains to their roles as aspiring representatives and current elected officials. So the authors bring forth considerable evidence supporting their hypothesis that Black women's appearance has political implications and that dominant Eurocentric beauty standards influence the electoral chances of Black women in varied and distinct ways. So if this is one finding that we take away from the book, that is it, that Black women's appearance matters for their electoral chances in varied and distinct ways. And there are so many varied and distinct ways, so I can't wait to get into that. So the analysis and the structure of the book evaluates interpretive, qualitative, and quantitative evidence for how Black women, both as humans and as elites, modify their position, modify their appearance to be recognized in politics. So this is a comprehensive uh, data collection and analysis effort. And throughout it centers Black women, which like Dara said, is rare in the study of political science. And this is a must read book for scholars of gender and politics because it offers a serious, well-executed and intersection intersectional analysis of the body politics of Black women. So this is kind of the primary um, intersection with my work thinking about inequality uh, political psychology and behavior, and particularly how uh, those things matter for Black women. So there are a few areas that I think um, should frame the comments that I have for this session, and I really like to hear um, the authors reflect. So the first area is really digging into the narrative of class and respectability politics for Black women. So on page um, 52, which I'm not sure which part it, um, that is, you all mentioned that Black women um, have certain, Black women are evaluated by the extent to which their actions, style choices, and lifestyle choices adhere to whiteness. So this is the big piece on respectability. So the goal is to examine how Black women have been simultaneously race, gendered, class, and how this is used to um, communicate their personal self and is viewed as a geographic marker. So from hearing this about the chapter, I expected it to engage deeply with the role of respectability in its relationship to class. For Black women in elite spaces, maintenance and styling of hair is costly, both in time and financial resources. It depends on the availability of professionals, a lot of which you detail in an earlier chapter. Um, so I'm wondering in what ways um, did you all consider the kind of the political economy of hair and maintenance, and how do you make sense of lower class representatives who aren't aspiring um, to kind of enter into this space of being a respectable, um, representing themselves in a respectable fashion, and if they're making similar uh, choices that it comes to their appearance. So I know you did um, interviews from 2014 to 2017, so I'm just interested in beyond the themes that were mentioned in the book, 
are there any other um, comments around how class and respectability interplay to shape um, Black women's appearance? So, and then thinking through that, another point that uh, Dara mentioned is thinking about the socialization of these values um, embedded in appearance. Um, the thing that you heard in the focus groups in Texas and with members of the sorority, how can we think about counteracting the socialization around respectability? Must you look like a politician to be active? And can, in an experimental context, can we understand the ways that Black women and girls are kind of rejecting some of the norms of respectability? And are they embracing more um, radical looks or other, be, other um, characteristics beyond the light straight, the curly, um, and the braids. So this is just kind of an extension. Can we think about ways that beyond Black women elite, what is the message for Black women and girls, and particularly girls aspiring to enter into politics? Is there a way to counteract these negative, um, well, not negative, but not so progressive views on appearance for Black women? Um, another area of expansion, or I think is a reasonable um, project to undertake, is the history of hair and fashion as virtue signaling. So this is something that was addressed. Um, hair has been examined in American studies, Black studies, history, and sociology, and we don't have much as it pertains to appearance in hair in political science. So beyond uh, the Black Power Movement in the 1970s, embracing coily textures, let's say had its beginnings in the early 2000s, late 90s, and this also like coincides with the economic recession of 2001 and also in 2008 and 2012, we see these big um, increases in Black women embracing um, natural hair. I wonder in what ways uh, you all kind of relate this narrative to um, consumerism and spending habits of Black women. So should we see a diversification in styles kind of shifting with the economy? And is that something that um, is meaningful to how Black women present themselves um, as politicians. So are we ever um, in any way moving away from political hair versus what is just make, what is something to maintain um, being a legislator that has demands on time, including um, family, life, home, et cetera. And I know this is something that you all got into in the experiment um, in the second, the second experiment in the chapter before the last chapter on linked fate, saying that the voters did not believe appearance was connected to socioeconomic status. It was a post-treatment, um, I guess like manipulation tech to ensure that that, I, I don't remember the specifics of the experiment, but I do know you all found that there weren't effects of socioeconomic status. And I'm just kind of curious, is that a finding that surprised you all? Or is that something that you wanna go back and revisit thinking about where kind of class fits in in the self-presentation narrative for Black women and how do Black um, voters or Black Democrats make sense of class as it pertains to the presentation of representatives? Um, second, well not second, but third, um, I'm really interested in the findings that you all had around colorism. And I, as um, America shifts, demographic shifts occur, um, what types like, what is your view of how readers should walk away with the implications for lighter and dark skinned women seeking office? So not what you wrote in the book. It can be what you wrote in the book, but we know, you know, that may not necessarily be normatively what your thoughts are around how, um, what the implications of your findings are. But I'm just curious to say, the chapter leads us to believe that candidates of different hues to alter their messages in order to be palatable for different demographics. And I don't know if that's necessarily a message that has legs or will be received well, or is something that we can um, toss around. So I want you to, to think a little bit out loud about, so when your reader reads this book, what do you want them to walk away with in terms of the message? What's that risk for calling attention to a prototype? Is it that we want to kind of engage with the content of someone's character versus their appearance, which I would never say that again, but just thinking, how do you want people to walk away with what the, the aesthetics and their value um, to politics? My last um, comment is really another area of expansion 
thinking about the role of state and local politics and how it matters to this story, I believe more than you all emphasize. So Georgia leads the nation in the number of Black female legislature, legislators. Over 16% of their state house is Black women across the political spectrum. And this is in 2021, so it's reasonable that it's not included in the book. Um, and you all discussed the Crown Act and its um, diffusion across the U.S. states. But we know that that's also tethered to where the Crown Act is introduced is where Black women, uh, well, not just Black women, but where there's a sizable majority of Black women representatives, there's a Black um, demographic. How do we really understand kind of another point that Dara raised about state and local versus regional, how do these things kind of matter in terms of descriptive representation for African Americans and other um, groups? Seeing that the legislation varies so much across states, um, is it worth thinking about the places where Black women can be elected and kind of where we can actually see some of the experiments occur in a real world, real world setting? Because um, we can count on our hands the, the amount of times that we've seen two Black candidates run against each other. So how can we think about where these scenarios would come out into play? So those are the big extent of um, my comments. And I just want to emphasize how important this work is um, for students, one, combining different methods of inquiry, but also the clearness to which you write um, is something that I could hand to my mother who has a different hair texture than I, I could hand to my aunt. I could hand to my mixed heritage cousin and everybody can walk away with a message of empowerment. So I wanna thank you all for giving this work um, to the political science, the academic community, but also practitioners who have to market, well, not even market, but have to work with candidates so that they can show up as their full and authentic selves. So I will stop there and I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, Dara and Christine, for your really deep and thorough engagement. We do not have enough time, unfortunately, to jump into all of these. I'm looking at the at the clock and thinking, we should have started about 45 minutes ago. <laughs> but it is what it is. It is what it is. Danielle, do you want to do you want to um, start responding first, and then I can jump in? Yeah. These were awesome comments, so thoughtful. Um, thank you so much for reading our work so closely and asking really good questions. I don't think I'll be able to get to all the questions before we end here, but um, I do want to speak to like, what should people take from this, right? And I think one of the things that we want readers to take, whether it be, you know, candidates or political consultants, right? Right. So like, you know, when you're a candidate, you hire a team to like think about all this stuff for you. Um, I think we want folks in, in the political space to think about when you're advising, you know, a Black woman who's considering running for office or in the thick of a campaign, and when you're making these comments like, oh, you, you should dress this way, you should do your hair that way, you know, present yourself in this way, that isn't coming from nowhere, right? It comes from somewhere. You have to recognize that the politics of beauty, unfortunately, occurs against the backdrop of white supremacy. Right. And so when you're saying, oh, well, you know, you don't look professional like this or like, you know, cover up your body in this way. Right. Like it's coming from somewhere. And so I think that's um, that's a big takeaway that I think we wanted um, readers to get from the book. And a lot of it is about recognizing that the black woman who's running for office, considering running for office, they're a person. And so you can't just make these comments flippantly like, oh, that doesn't look good or like whatever like that's a person who's gonna run for office and so i think a lot of times you know when we talk about the politics of appearance or we talk about beauty being political i think folks who don't experience um you know whether it be non-black women non-black people generally folks who don't experience this they don't understand what what is being said when we're like this is racist when you say oh you you this you, you know your natural hair doesn't look good or like whatever like it's racist and people should just understand that and recognize you're advising a person who's running for office and like whatever choices that person makes you know this piece of scholarship is a piece of information it's a tool to just help them calculate what they want to do it's not uh telling people what they want to do it's just a piece of information and i think that's the value of the book and and i'll add we had um 
I had a lot of data that did not make its way into the book. Um, so as you mentioned, data collection started in 2014 and went all the way up to 2021. So I was reminded of a, of a woman, a Rep black Republican who ran and she's in the, she's in the book. Um, but she was really upfront about how much it costs to get, um, get her hair straightened. And that was um that was an interview conducted in 2014 um right and but then to fast forward this to an interview to a focus group that we conducted in 2019 right danielle's at the year 20 yeah before the world shut down 2020 i don't know COVID time um right one of the focus groups participants shared that she, in order to see as a viable candidate, she has to put on wigs or do something else to her hair, right? And and that was ex that is expensive, right? And she's a single mom, and she's running because she really wants to see a change in her community, and she feels like she's the best person. She put herself forward because she felt like other people that were running weren't the best options for the community because they didn't know the community the way that she did, and she started to cry in our in our focus groups. Um, even detailing, right, this, there was a white woman who was running against her and what the white woman looked like. But part of what she shared, right, and they kind of left it off at the end and said, you know, I got this dress from Target. I'm Target, you know, I'm Target chic, right? So recognizing that, you know, she's a single parent, she's working within her budget, um, and with her natural hair, she wasn't seen as viable. But because of her commitment, right, to, to helping her community, she wanted to do that. But it was still in that conversation. It was, um, you know, she had so many things that she was saying during during um, during our that one spotlight on her at during the focus group that it went from like yeah, the political economy to running against white women to electability to what it's like to be a single parent right and the, her motivation like it all just came out and as a researcher right who is trying to present things in a neat tidy bow so that people can walk away with a with a finding or um, or understand your point it's really difficult to sometimes distill all of that down. So um, again, there's a lot, of, a lot of data that um, you know made it, you know, is on the cutting floor that I think whatever can help to respond to many of the questions that were asked today. This might be a second book. I don't know. I know Danielle and I are at <laughs> an overload of projects right now. But there, I mean, there were so many, um, so some of the things, again, like the focus groups happening, uh, how do people think or talk about hair outside of the South? And this question, right, that that Dara asked about these women. And, you know, Christine picked up on this as well. Um, yes, would have been great to be able to do focus groups around, um, you know, around, around the nation and seeing how women are their region and their cultural background because of their region influences the kind of hair that they think is appropriate and professional. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to do this, um, but I think it's a it's a worthwhile project if someone else is looking forward, looking to do some some other things. Um, and then and then lastly, I'll I'll go to the last question that um, Christine asked about what's at risk for a prototype. I mean, part of me feels very optimistic that we're living in a time period, we're discussing this book in a time period where there is a Kamala Harris, where there is a Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, right? That, um, yeah, Danielle and I are writing a response piece where we're highlighting this, the race in Dallas that um, is going to take over, I'm not in Dallas, Houston, um, uh, Edie Bernice Johnson's long held seat in, in Congress with two black women going to a runoff, right? So. I think some of the things around prototype are still really, really prevalent, right? That we can look at a black woman and say she is or isn't electable. But the part that I want to be optimistic about is saying we're living in a time period we never would have saw this happening. When I got my dissertation years ago, I was told there's no there there. Why are you studying black women? There's no variation. There's no difference. Um, we first started running these experiments and people said to us, why are you putting two black women against one another? That's never going to happen, right? Um, and just in a few short years from the, I mean, short years in the arc, you know, in the arch of you know, this conversation, not necessarily like in time periods, but um, things have changed, right? And we're seeing black women and black politics change drastically. Um, 
um, thinking most also about two congressional seats that went to black women, that black women are picking up, right? Alcee Hastings seat, picked up John Lewis's seat, right? Like places that were long held by black men. These voters see black women as the rightful heirs of these canonical leaders, but also they're leaders in their own right. And hopefully our book speaks to some of this, what the future might hold for these women. Um, and that hopefully other people that are writing their dissertations now or junior scholars won't have the same kind of questions that were asked to me and Danielle um, through our viewers saying that this was a pie in the sky project or that we were naive or foolish for um, designing our work in this way. I hate that I can believe, like I, I know that that's what happened, but that is just so, terrible <laughs> what does that say about the state of the discipline when something like this that i honestly was honored like truly honored to be able to read this book and review it and come here and speak with y'all today for people to have said that this was something that wasn't important that really honestly blows my mind um i just <laughs> that is crazy to well it's not crazy again it's just yeah. very disheartening that that was something that was said and i i hope you're right that that's not a conversation that people will have to have anymore, but I feel like it, it will be for a little while just because you know how people are. They don't want to change, but they have to. Like you said, it, the world is changing. So hopefully, hopefully, yeah, from your lips to God's ears. But I also, again, like back to, I think, Christine's opening remarks, right? I think it's telling that NCOPES is allowing us to do this, right? It's showing the expansiveness of Black politics, what is considered as Black politics being on the vanguard. Um, there will always be naysayers, um, but some stuff is just factual now, right? Like just some things you can't say, uh, we're always gonna talk about a VP as a white man. It ain't happening no more, right? Like we're always gonna talk about members of Congress, Black members of Congress as Black men. It's, we just can't anymore. So what do they have to say? <laughs> right? like I, ha I have receipts, wait, well, sir, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I wanted to say more about the opportunities to look at different regions. I mean, I, I think there are so many opportunities to, to build on, on what we looked at in the book. Like I'm just thinking about California, right? Like what does it mean to be a black woman running in the district in California where no group holds a majority, right? How do you, what does it mean when you're trying to appeal to a district that might be majority Asian American? What does that dynamic look like? And so Nadia is right. I mean, like there are so many real world examples that we can pull from that there's just no reason for political scientists to be like, oh, well, that's so unrealistic. What about your external validity? It's like, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. <laughs> So we are at the very end of our time. Um, I'm again so sorry that we could not get to all of these um, all of these questions um, because they yeah they're just thoughtful um, and I appreciate Danielle and I appreciate the engagement with the work. I'm hopeful that um, others will have the same deep engagement with the work and invite us to continue talking about the relevance of black women political elites. Um, I think that's a real win for the discipline when we can do this. So a heartfelt thank you to Christine and Dara. Um, shout out to my sororers of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We had to put that out there. <laughs> I love y'all, love y'all, love you. Love thank you too. Thank you Danielle for being such a great continued co-author in the midst of it all, extra babies, transitions in life. Um, yeah, couldn't imagine going on this journey with, um, with another scholar, so thank you. All right, everyone, signing off. Thank you, NCOPES family, bye-bye. Okay, hold on, now I need to. <laughs>